You saved my again. What's this? A local. Let's get out of here before more droids show up. Jar Jar is a key character in episode one, and he actually was one of the hardest for us. Um, in, in the sense that he was going to be our really, uh, you know, one of the first pure all digital character th in, in a major motion picture. But that aside, you know, design wise, George has something very specific in mind. You may, you may be, say, be able to take that line, which is sort of somewhere around in here and go. George came to me with the character and basically right said, now. he's amphibious, he's tall, he um, means well but he's always putting his foot in his mouth, and he's like a combination of um, Charles Chaplin and Danny Kaye and all those kind of slapstick comedians that ever happened. He's a combination of, of duck-billed dinosaur and emu, basically, is about the best way I can I can describe him with, with the skin texture of an amphibian and the color pattern of a parrotfish. And so we started really thinking about, okay, well, what are the, the things that, you know, we would kind of like to see? And we decided to give him different proportions so that he would walk funny. Uh, he would have a slightly different gait. So we, we gave his, you know, his proportion from his knee to his foot was a little bit longer than normal. It's something that's very subtle, but it gave him a really gangly type of walk. Well, first of all, the ratite birds, which includes the ostriches and the emus and the rias and the cassowaries, or when they walk, their their necks go kind of this bump, 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 and then they kind of have this. I'd have to get up and demonstrate it, but <laughs> and the way just even if you see a chicken walk, it's funny. It just is humorous, but it's like, it's graceful at the same time. I wanted to give that to this character. We shall make you bombard general. General. Originally, Jar Jar had short ears, and George thought, well, how about if he had long, floppy ears? You know, uh, they might be really funny if when he turns his head, the ears flop around. And so he did that, and actually, you know, it was one of those things where it's like, wow, that works. Uh, and then George, of course, wanted him to be very expressive. And so we thought, okay, well, what's expressive? You know, what can we do with the eyes to make them very comedic? And we thought, okay, well, they should be on stock so they can pop out. They could do all these things. Gave him a big mouth so he could do wild, crazy expressions. And so all those things, all those pieces start to sort of uh, blend together into creating who Jar Jar is now. Steady, steady. The biggest thing was finally was coming up with that concept drawing that George said, yeah, that's him. And then I did orthographics, all um, the side, the front, the back side, the skeleton, the muscles. My background is vertebrate zoology and paleontology, and that was my training. And so basically, I look at nature, what has gone before, whether it's a prehistoric species or a current species, blend those together, how do those anatomies work in real time and in real life? The people that I think were the hardcore Star Wars fans may have had a problem simply because he was new <laughs> and because he was kind of a funny, a funny one. Um, but children loved him.
We see the Federation battleship right at the beginning of the film. It's the opening sequence. And traditionally in the other Star Wars films, we always used to see a Star Destroyer. They were playing around with different ideas for it, and one of them was a saucer a really large saucer that was kind of detailed sort of like a Star Destroyer and that it had a trench around the outer edge that had all the little details and things that we've seen on the Star Destroyers in the past. And they had a little inset, top and bottom. So that was one idea, and another idea was kind of a ring. And the idea was that this ring had kind of claws, four claws that would hold a sphere inside this thing. So it was like a donut with a tennis ball sitting in it. And Doug did a couple of concept drawings that were the version that we've got where it's kind of got the opening and it's got the ball. And initially the idea, I think, was that the ball could rotate on the end of the neck that was inside so that the body could swing around and the ball would remain stationary. And there are two different versions of it. There's kind of the standard ship and then there's another ship that's the command ship that has a tremendous array of antennas and things attached to it. And that was executed as both an eight-foot model and then also a much, much larger surface section. The model, I think, was probably like 20 feet by 30 feet. We did make close-up sections of it. Uh, there's a scene where um, some ch ships are flying through the, it, its antennas areas, and, and so we'd have to make big versions of, of you know, take a little bit piece on the ship and make it, you know, 12 feet across. And so we did a lot of that. Uh, sections, uh, large sections. Uh, we had some moving guns. They were motion control movement guns, so that was kind of neat. There's a certain level of detail that's done initially, and then you get the thing out on set, and the camera's coming right up on a section of it, and you have to go in and just very delicately detail out to the best of your ability to make this thing look huge. You know, you're, you're doing whatever you can. It's always a cheat, but you're trying to go in there and put enough detail on it to make it look huge. We had to light that model up from the inside with uh, custom fluorescent lighting and little little holes in the paint scheme to make a, a scale of the lights look small and, and consequently make the model look big. That was a very difficult one to, uh, to build because of its shape and uh, it, it got heavy. <laughs> it got really heavy. That thing was a monster. There's more metal in that than there is in my car. It's really amazing to go from being on stage with this big hunk of plastic and then to see it in the film where it's actually, you know, it's drifting above a planet and there are lights blinking and all this stuff's happening. And you know, like I said, there's sort of this magical process between what you were working with on stage and what's in the film. The Republic Cruiser is the ship that we see at the beginning of episode one. It kind of comes down and descends into the Federation battleship. And then shortly after that, they destroy it inside the hangar bay. It blows up. I've been through this a number of times where they blow up. And when I first started in the model shop, everybody used to joke that what they should do with the new people is they should have them build something and just let them just work on it until it's just perfect. And when they finally got it where everything's just the, the way they want it, they should have to put it on the floor and jump up and down on it and smash it. Just to kind of get you in that, that mode of we're going to blow it up. And the first couple times we blew things up, it's kind of hard. But after a while, you start building them and you realize that's what they're, they're you're building it just to blow it up. We've loaded it up, you know, with, you know, hits relatively big enough to, you know, destroy the model. Probably about the first six inches. The success of any kind of a pyrotechnic explosion on a model is based on how the, the size of the flames and explosives play against the model. If the model's too small, then the flames look really funny. And, you know, they, they compensate it with high-speed photography. But uh, sometimes we, we can do some really great uh, miniature explosions that help us out a lot. Roll camera.
The concept model, I think, was probably about 22, 23 inches long. And then we built one for production that we used on set that was about eight feet long. We had one hero model that had operational landing gear and internal lighting and everything. And then we had three pyro ones that we used for the scene where it blows up. It did kind of harken back to the original Star Wars films in terms of the look. It and the Federation battleship both had kind of the same surface detail. The hull plating had little notches in it and kind of the same level of little greeblies and things like that. So it was really fun to make that one because it really did go back to the original Star Wars look. I'm ambassador to the Supreme Chancellor. I'm taking these people to Coruscant. Coruscant, uh, that doesn't compute. Uh, wait, uh, you're under arrest. Designing the battle droid was a real collaborative effort. Um, Doug Chang and the other artists would come up with designs for parts of the robot or things that were the they were very specific about, Doug was very particular about the shape of the head, and uh, we went, actually went through about five different iterations of the shape of the head before we nailed what, what he was really after. Um, but then there were other parts that were left to me to design. Uh, a lot of the artwork didn't include feet, didn't include the back, um, other parts of the body, and so those were left to me to, to design. Doug really wanted to have a very skeletal look to the whole robot. He wanted to hearken it back to the old Jason of the Argonauts uh, skeletons. So we tried to keep everything very gaunt. And in fact, they were bone white to begin with and later changed to a tan. We didn't know exactly what the droid was going to have to do, but we assumed that the battle droid would have to have complete mobility uh, as, as if it was a human being. And so it had to be able to climb stairs and ladders and do whatever, you know, carry a gun, that sort of thing. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that it could actually function that knee joints were in the right position, ankles and hips, wrists, hands and arms were really one of those things that you can draw things that look like they work and then when you actually try and make it work, it might not, so you just adjust it a little bit to make it so that it functions properly. Well, it's a really a, a neat experience to see something that you've worked on for a long time uh, and then to actually see it on screen and moving around and interacting with other people and and knowing, wow, I, I worked on that. That was something that I did.
Yeah, I think it's good. I wouldn't do this on all of them. Okay. Again, I would say this is the most distressed. Okay. The Naboo fighter was the first model I did in the art department for Star Wars. Doug Chang gave me these really, really early sketches of the design, and it was just sort of this teardrop-shaped, very sleek, very, at the time, non-Star Wars kind of looking. Prior to that, all the Star Wars models had been this very boilerplate, exposed parts, um, you know, panels missing, paint chips, all that sort of thing. And here was something that was sleek and chrome and beautifully smooth painted like it just came out of the body shop. I think we haven't really addressed down here is like paint chips and things. Do you want to see that again or is it okay that it's all... I think we can keep it pretty much the way it is. I mean, the, the one thing that I would tone down a little bit is this. Okay. Something else that evolved with the uh, Naboo fighter over time was originally the wings weren't as uh, fared into the body. It was part of just the design evolution where it, I think it looked a lot better once it was all blended together and uh, fared into the body. It just became much more cohesive design. It was so sleek it had to be very clean. Couldn't have little bumps and lumps and anything. And the tail of it got so thin that it was very easy to just snap off a little piece of it and I would imagine that by the end of the shooting schedule that the end of that tail probably lost a good inch or so because it just kept breaking off little pieces of it as we uh, as we went. One of our big things is when they light them they they have to light them extra strong for high-speed photography and uh, sometimes if you're not watching the, those folks you know your model will <laughs> melt. So that was a, sometimes a little bit of a problem. Fortunately, we made copies. Yeah, oh, I was tremendously proud of it. It was establishing a new look for Star Wars and a whole new world to kind of join into the Star Wars universe. It was really exciting to see, to actually see it flying around, to see uh, it engaging in battles that uh, you know, were now part of uh, Star Wars history. The Sando Aqua Monster, he is the hugest, most dangerous nemesis in the underwater world of Naboo, and he is the largest as it is a fish in the sea. In fact, he's the size of about two princess cruise ship liners. That's how big he is. He preys upon OPC killers. He has them for dessert breakfast, lunch, snacks, whenever he feels like it. I wanted to make it more mammalian, even though he has got gills. There's a lot of panther, there's a lot of tiger in this animal, crossed with an otter, a little bit of whale, and a little bit of deep water um, fish, just for the luminescence, a little bit of the tail. In my biology of this creature, not only does it have gills, but it does have some lungs. It can haul itself out on the surface if it wants to, if it wants to say, snatch a large oblivious mammal thundering by, it can. When I saw this creature on screen, I was absolutely thrilled. This was just probably about my favorite creature that, oh, that I worked on. I pictured it in my mind being awesome, but to see it that way and to see just the shots of going over its back and how long and large and detailed it was. I wish that they had had the budget to show, show more of it, and more of it, and more of it. Star Wars creatures are animals that you can relate to. You think 
I, I saw something like this in the zoo or the aquarium or my dinosaur book. I think I can imagine being able to ride that creature, to pet it, to run away from it, to that it, ex it could exist. And it makes the movies real. And I think that's where George had his genius. And he allowed me and my other co-workers to do that, to say, let's bring some things to life. What an incredible opportunity. There's always a bigger fish. At last, we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last, we will have revenge. Well, the Darth Maul character isn't based at all, really, on anything in the other movies. Um, I think George Lucas wanted him to obviously have a, a feel with uh, dark cloak, um, dark colours, and also quite a lot of talk of sort of samurai warriors and um, links with the East, the sort of warrior cultures from the East and the sort of costume that would enable the character to do sort of movements, quite large sort of stunt type fights with some interesting movement in the costume. As soon as you start to move, the, the, the fabric sort of spreads out on the top layer and then underneath it has a sort of a, a slightly Japanese feel with lots of layers that would in Japan have been sort of armoured layers and we've done them out of different weights of fabric. He has some prosthetics on his head and then his whole face is painted. Um, you obviously have to allow for the, the problems with keeping a hood on a head over the top of horns uh, without causing the actor any discomfort. So we tried to keep the fabric fairly light but also fairly dense, but dense enough to give us a movement, to give us the sort of movement we wanted in um, for the fight sequences. <laughs>
George talked about wanting to have a large chrome ship, very Art Deco-ish, fast-looking form. And we had some SR-71 Blackbird model kits. We were taking them and cutting off the noses and putting the bodies together and experimenting with that. And George saw the box and said, do that. And if you look at it, you can plainly see that it's inspired by the SR-71. The concept model, there was a small foam one built that was maybe five, six inches long to get the basic buy-off on proportion shape just to see if everybody was on the same page. That got approved and then went to a larger model that was about maybe a little over two feet long. And that was fully detailed, had these long spikes coming off the back of it, and we had it sent it out and had it chromed. Chrome's really a difficult thing because the full-size model we built was 11 feet long. We're trying to figure out how we're going to get that kind of surface on it. There wasn't a tank big enough to chemically plate it or to vacuum plate it. So Mylar was the selection we came up with, and they did some tests with a couple of the Nebu fighters and took some two-inch Mylar tape and just kind of stuck it everywhere. And if you look at them up close, they're really crude, but on film it looks great. At the moment, we're finding problems with the adhesive. However, we're sure we'll be able to achieve what they want. Our model is going to be scrutinized much more closely. So we went to a heavier Mylar from 3M that was, I think, 30 inches wide. The Mylar kind of only wants to go in one direction. It doesn't like compound curves. If you tried to put it over a dome, it wouldn't work. On the Queen ship, there was enough of a compound curve to it that we'd come back in the mornings, and the Mylar would have peeled symmetrically on it and create these little puckers. And so each day, we would cut those to relieve the structure of it. Symmetry by hand is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to, to do by using 3D models and having uh, a CNC machine sculpt it out. One thing that's cool about it is you, you can actually just make half the ship and then mirror image it and you get exact duplicate uh, mirror image. We actually shot it up on the roof of uh, the ILM uh, shooting stage so that we wouldn't get any phone poles and things. And so in the background was actually the sky of the Bay Area. The camera crews, they had to cover their areas up so that you wouldn't see the camera reflected into it. To see it go from a concept painting and then see scenes with the actors in Tunisia with a ramp and then to composite that with our miniature looks pretty amazing. It's always interesting when you combine all those elements and this magic happens where it suddenly becomes this, you know, 200 foot long spaceship and people running out of the door and you know, you realize it was just shot up on top of the main stage on a tabletop. That's that's me. Well, this is a, this is no, this is a Kadu, and that's Jar Jar. This is an EOP. That's what you're on right now. The EOP is it's kind of a camel-like creature, and a native of Tatooine, a desert animal, clearly that uh, Anakin rides at some point in the film. I sculpted the original concept ma maquette. In the case of a lot of the characters, sometimes the team would give me orthographic views. That's like a straight side view, a straight front view, a straight top view. So I had a real sense of the anatomy of the character. In the case of the Eopia, um, I don't think the artwork was that fleshed out at the time. It was more of a concept drawing of placing Anakin on the EOP in a scene riding in the desert and kind of how it would look and feel in the film. So I was just working from that artwork. The EOP was a, a big challenge, but it, for me it was a really fun challenge. This is one of my favorite pieces of sculpture in my entire career, I have to say. First I had to create an animal, then I had to create a human sitting on the animal, and then all these little tiny details, his saddle blankets and packs and rolls, and I would use strings and threads to tie them together. So part of the challenge really was building up all those details, and uh, which you don't get to do in a maquette that's going to be scanned for CG, but for uh, a design concept maquette where you really want all these details, that becomes part of the challenge, but also a lot of the fun, because when you can get all these little tiny things working together, it, and it looks really cool at the end, it's really satisfying. 
Uh, just mounting up. So Andy's through first. Rocking. <laughs> You'll be sort of simulating the movements of a horse. Right. So you feel that you don't feel really secure. What do you mean by that? I'll tell you later. So Watto is the uh, junk dealer on Tatooine. You know, actually, I started out as an actor, not as a sculptor. So when I sculpt uh, a character, I'm not looking at it as a sculpture. I'm looking at it as a character. And so anything I add to it, and this is all subconscious, mind you, anything I add to it as far as expression or look or feeling of the character just all comes from my own, uh, I guess, actor's perspective on looking at the character. If I'm sculpting expression on the face or any kind of look in the shapes of the face, I tend to make faces, you know, as if I'm looking in a mirror um, because I have sort of a muscle perception of my own face. So if I'm doing something, I can kind of see it in my mind what I'm doing and I will carry that across to the character. Sculpting an early version of a maquette when you're just trying to finalize the design of the character. You would sculpt the character in some kind of pose or with expressions on his face, you know, really trying to express the character. When you get to the point of making it actually a working tool, as the Watto sculpture is, that it would actually be scanned, we have to take things into consideration, mainly that the character is going to be sculpted in a completely neutral position because all of the movement is going to be added by animation. All of the facial expressions are going to be added by the CG modelers. And so the model that the CG artists always start with is a neutral posed model. But at the same time, it still has to convey the qualities of that particular character. But you want to win the race, so it makes no difference. Part of my <laughs> performing background, not only as an actor, I used to be a clown with Ringling Brothers Circus. And so comedy and comic characters are, uh, you know, that's kind of the heart of me, you know? So, uh, so when I saw Watto, I thought of him as uh, a fun comic character. The design uh, definitely conveyed that. And, and he's just a fun character. His uh, dialogue is very funny, and he was a treat to see come to life on screen. Credits will do fine. No, they won't. Credits will do fine. No, they won't. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm a Toydarian. Mind tricks don't work on me. Only money. George came to one of our mini art meetings and said, one of the main pod racers is not a very nice person, and he walks on his hands and drives with his feet, and he's small because he has a fit of pod racers. Uh -oh. That was my assignment. Okay. The week before, George had just signed off on Jar Jar. I was so happy I went home and had a party. A purple Sebulba. The fun thing was Jar Jar took a year and a half, and I came up with this idea, George, liked it immediately. An afternoon's work. It's good to me. That afternoon he signed up on it. I was so happy. <laughs> He's great. He's going to be one of the great characters. He's going to rival Job of the Hut. It was weird. It was the face that was really difficult to interpret from the drawing. 
because you can have a front view and a side view, and that's pretty much all you need. But it had so many intricate changes in its face that it really was difficult to figure out, does this go in, does that go out, whatever. I thought to myself, what animal is almost always grumpy or it seems to be grumpy? And I thought, I know, camels. His face and his neck, you look at him, that's a camel. You start off with the basic camel head and stick on some kind of gnarly teeth and pointy things. I always call these things pointy things. People have different hairstyles and such. And of course, he doesn't have any hair, but he does have skin. And so I thought, OK, I'll look at catfish. So that kind of gave him a dreadlock, a kind of a hairstyle, kind of a fashion. He'd move his head, and then just a second later, you'd see dreadlocks moving. That would be a neat effect on screen. So anything you can think of that could add just a little extra something to a character that's on screen, you add. Initially, I had him with longer teeth, but it was harder to make him talk, so I, we had to reduce those a little bit. The fact that he can walk in both hands mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is the eerie part of this. Mm -hmm. Bipedally, he could kind of move sort of like a chicken because his elbows would act as the backward-facing ankle that a chicken would use. Where he's leaping into, say, a pod racer, then you have to think of more like a jumping spider, a little bit of spider, a little bit of chicken. And he's painted kind of like a purple Easter egg. When Sebulba and Anakin were at the end of the race and Sebulba's motors take off and then he goes tumbling, 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 that actually was a model that actually uh, tumbles and skids and then at the very end jumps up and stops. The camera operator said, well, hey, why don't we just screw a piece of wood in there so it hits something. They put bungee cords and then launched it. And that's what you see in the movie. And it just uh, the slides along and boom, hits that thing. With the Deadbolt puppet, it was nice because it was actually a practical puppet that we did. Because I think there was actually possibly 15 to 20 characters that I heard that they were going to be puppets, and then it started to change and turned out into about, about two. <laughs> so we, we ended up making these two puppets, and one was Deadbolt, and it was a great opportunity for me because I was excited to do at least one. We figured out we wanted to make it into a hand puppet. It was molded and casted out of, I think it was latex, or parts of it probably maybe foam latex, and then put some other stuff inside of it to make it a little more strength, like cheesecloth or something. And then after done, we put cures and then put polyfoam in it. And it was a really neat kind of armor-type costume on it that was like, I think, vacuum form pieces, and then they cover, covered leather on it and um, dyed the leather and had little pieces of, uh, I don't know, greeblies, I know we call it, for little model parts and everything. The green sticks that you see sticking out of the puppet itself is uh, basically puppeteering rods that we use to manipulate the puppet and make it come alive. It was me and Mark Siegel who puppeteered it on set, and John Noel came by as, as the uh, visual effects supervisor and to shoot the, the character, and it was a lot of fun. It was like about a, a day's worth of filming, and then they picked about three seconds of the film and they put it in there, so it's one of those things where I'm always kind of used to I'm just glad that we were able to make it and puppeteer it and have it on film, and then, you know, when you see it, you could pause it to see it and stuff, and sometimes you have it a little, a little longer, but usually it's, it's a few seconds long, but it's the way it goes, you know. And back again, it's the mighty Doug Boat with that incredible racing machine, the Boat Dream 327.
There were a lot of different pod racers, and this one was kind of a very early concept. And it looks like two 747 engines with this cockpit thing behind it. They incorporated airplane pieces and things into them, but they weren't just generic airplane engines. There was what they were all custom built, sci-fi, Star Wars, you know, pod racers. That was the first concept model I made for Star Wars, and it was really interesting because it was the first time I was exposed to George looking at artwork or a model or anything like that. And he talked for about 15 minutes about exactly how this thing would work. And the feeling I got was this guy was at the pod race yesterday and he's telling a story about, well, this thing opens up and this, this electrical energy thing comes out and all these details about it. And I was just amazed. I was mesmerized by the fact that he could just do that. I know he'd been thinking about it for a long time, but it was really interesting to have him look at the model and just, this is how this would work. And, you know, it was really, really fascinating. And I saw him do it a couple other times where it was just off the top of his head. He'd come up with all these mechanical explanations for things. The large models that we built, for the most part, they didn't wind up in the film. They wound up being model and texture reference for the CG department. Some of them did. There was like a hangar set where all the pods were parked and we had them in there. But it was really interesting to go from that early model that was, you know, cobbled together in my garage to these bigger versions of these engines that are, you know, four feet long and incorporating that level of detail. One of the things I came up with just to kind of expedite things was a mold of these detail panels. This is what we would get out of it, and it's just this floppy plastic type material paint it up and you get something that looks like that which you could take and wrap around these tube structures on the pod racers to put other details on top of it but it's just kind of a neat trick On Tatooine, Darth Maul is riding around out in the desert with sort of a wheel-like thing, sort of a half, you know, sort of a semicircle. It reminded me of an outboard motor and half of a tire, kind of. <laughs> I always loved to just get a sketch and be able to run with it. That was, the, that was the most fun. And at that point, I don't know that the character was defined so much as Darth Maul, but there was a lot of exploration. It was all really cool stuff. This guy was going to be, he was going to be a really great bad guy. I remember making that model at Christmas because I used to cart a little model shop in a box back to the East Coast for the Christmas break and work on stuff. And I remember sitting by the fireplace working on that one. Darth Maul's speeder wasn't absolutely nailed in the drawing. There was some room for, for adding some little details here and there. And for, you know, when you're doing this, you're kind of looking at it, you're going, well, this is, it's this big. A guy's going to be on it. You know, what the handle grips, you know, are going to be, what are they going to be? They're gonna, I use coiled solder for those, so it gives it a little bit of texture. And what's the seat back going to be? And I think that was maybe sculpted with clay. One of the things I put on it was a little bit of the Death Star wall detail that we saw in Episode 4, where you've got these long slots in the walls with all the lights in them. And that is on the bottom of it. There's an area of that that's, that's included in it. It was really weird to go from the conceptual end of it and see it executed, because it wasn't generated as a full-size vehicle. It was just basically, I think, a chair that he sat on, and then it was replaced with a digital speeder.
So this is red and then this is red. And then this would be red? Yeah. Now this is the um, sort of middle robe of the Queen's Senate costume. I will not defer. I've come before you to resolve this attack on our sovereignty now. It started off just as a plain red, we call it red shot green, because the underneath of the, the velvet is green and the top pile was red, so you get a hint of green. We then embroidered into it in various colours of gold. There's three or four shades of gold in here. And after we had embroidered it, we then ruched up uh, the velvet to give this sort of very lush... Uh, effect here. I wish I had your confidence in this tactic, Senator. We must force a new election for Supreme Chancellor. This is the underdress from the um, Queen's Senate costume. This is a, an old piece of fabric from the beginning of this century. As you can see, we only have pleated the front of the dress because there was only a very limited quantity of it and it couldn't be, couldn't be repeated. This is the uh, Queen's head dress for the Senate. Um, this is probably the heaviest <laughs> of uh, the, the headdresses that she wears. This is uh, sort of real gold. We made the, the pieces up and sent them off um, to be gold plated. We felt with this one that the quality of using real gold would, um, it was worth the sort of effort and the, the expense. I move for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum's leadership. This one, you keep your eyelash a little bit tighter, I move this one over yeah. here. And then at the very end, when you say that's something I cannot do, I'm going to move him right, just right this way. That is something I cannot do. This is the Queen, part of the Queen costume from uh, Palpatine's study. Her, we call it the Palpatine One costume. Uh, this was based uh, on sort of a Japanese kimono type costume, but we accentuated the sleeves a lot and sort of we sort of sometimes called it the penguin sleeves because they're, they're sort of very um, rounded and look a bit like a penguin. All this is a form of machine embroidery uh, with some hand embroidery, but this took quite a long time and sort of just was based on sort of a loose flowing uh, sort of soft design. This is a, an antique or old piece of um, beading that I found. <clears throat> I think it started off as a front piece of a, I'm not sure if it's an exotic dancer's skirt from 1920 or thereabout, but we turned this into a headdress for the uh, Palpatine one dress. This part came down onto Natalie's forehead and the beads were then draped up over the, the rest of the headdress, so we ended up with sort of a, a pearl, uh, almost pearl fringe as we call it, bangs, I think as you call it, um, and then various trailing uh, pearls. We initially thought of having it as a pearl veil, but when uh, George saw Natalie with it on, he actually, he draped it up and said, how about this, wouldn't this be nice? The courts take even longer to decide things than the Senate. Our people are dying, Senator. We must do something quickly to stop the Federation.
So the blue Senate Guard on episode one we see in Coruscant, and it's very reminiscent to the Red Guards um, from what we originally know from the original films. They were Coruscant Guards, and so Trish wanted to uh, to change it up a little bit, and so they made them blue and made um, the helmet a little bit different. It had you know an opening in the middle, and then it had um, a plume made out of horsehair. And they needed to progress and have an evolution through as they moved on to episode three. And um, so you can see that uh, they did change and they got more sort of reminiscent of the Red Guards with, you know, the, the closed face. And then um, the plume um, with the horsehair is gone. It's just a straight, um, really sleek line. Mm -hmm. 